as we are recording this. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Joanne Myers, Director of Public Affairs Programs. And on behalf of the Carnegie Council, I'd like to thank you for beginning your day with us. As an organization that has often welcomed C-SPAN Book TV to take many of our Books for Breakfast programs, we are honored to have this opportunity to host the founding CEO and chairman of this innovative cable satellite public affairs network, which is known more informally by its acronym C-SPAN, Brian Lamb. Brian will be presenting his findings from C-SPAN's widely recognized historian survey of presidential leadership in a new publication entitled, The Presidents, Noted Historians Rank America's Best and Worst Chief Executives. This book will be available for you to publish at the end of the program today. Forty years ago, one man had a dream. His dream, to open the doors to Washington's policymaking by providing gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of the US Congress without editing, analyzing, or commentary. A lot has changed in 40 years, but Brian's original big idea is now more relevant than ever. Over the years, C-SPAN has expanded from an unknown niche network to the network of record for public affairs, becoming a valuable tool for those wanting real time to access to the workings of the federal government and to those who influence it. Adding to its TV presence, C-SPAN has published a number of books using content from its very rich archives. The President's is an example of that effort. This publication draws on four decades of interviews conducted mainly by Brian with nationally recognized presidential historians or biographers such as Ron Chernow, Doris Kearns, Godwin, Robert Carroll, among others. Each chapter provides not just a complete ranking of all presidents who have completed their terms in office, but these interviews capture the leadership skills and character of the men who have held the office. As a side note, because Donald Trump has not yet completed his term, he is not included in the rankings, but near the end, there is a transcript of a conversation among three historians about him. As America looks ahead to the 2020 presidential election, a reading of the presidents encourages us to reflect not only about the broader lessons of history, but it also serves as a text on leadership, ethics, and moral authority. Please join me in welcoming the founding father and inspirational soul of C-SPAN, Brian Lamb. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for getting up early and coming in. I'll try to do the best I can to uh, not provide sleep opportunities <laughs> during the next 45 minutes. I grew up in uh, Lafayette, Indiana. I was schooled at Purdue University. and. I was not a great student. Um, and I mention all this because many of you in this room are well-schooled from fancy Eastern schools. There are some Midwesterners sitting right out here at this table. We were talking about it earlier. But my experience has been uh, just asking questions all my life. I was taught by a man named Bill Fraser in high school when I was 14 years old how to interview from the pers his perspective. And basically, it was ask questions and listen. And that's kind of the philosophy that uh, I've taken into what part of this C-SPAN experience I've been involved in. And I remember a time when I was a disc jockey on a local radio station. Um, and uh, I, I thought I wanted to be a radio star someday, doing reading poetry to co-eds. And uh, <laughs> there was a guy in Chicago by the name of Franklin McCormick on WGN radio. And I was 17, and my friend was 19. And one night when we shut the radio station down, I said, you know, I would love to call Franklin McCormick in Chicago and just ask him some questions. And he said, well, let's try. So we put a tape recorder on and a tape, in the, and we called him up. And he answered the phone. He was doing this all night show beautiful voice and all that. And one of my questions of him at the time was, you know, how can I get from where I am to where you are? Uh, and he gave me very good advice. He said, stay where you are as long as you can. <laughs> you can learn all about this business by being in a small market. He was absolutely right. And I did stay for five years as I went to school. But more importantly, I said to him, can we come up and sit in your studio all night and watch you work. And much to my surprise, he said yes. And so 
Mike and I drove up there, sat all night in the studio, had the most terrific experience. And it was just an experience, just the opportunity to sit there and watch how he did his job. We learned a lot. And that is the kind of the way that I've lived my life until one day, and I'm going to talk about some New Yorkers here because I think it's very important for you to get the background on why C-SPAN even exists. I was allowed to go into a room of about this many people. They were all cable television executives back in 1977 and make a pitch. And my pitch was unsophisticated, wasn't well thought out. It was, I think this cable industry has an opportunity to do public affairs in a way that has never been done before. Instead of uh, some network deciding they're going to cover one particular hearing, we could cover them all. We could do other programs, other voices. And out of the middle of that room came a man named Bob Rosencrans. Grew up in Long Island. Terrific human being. He's passed. He went to Columbia. Uh, and he said to me, I like what I hear from you, I think we can make that happen. And I said, really? I mean, I, there, <clears throat> there were 40 people in the room. Nobody else said a word. Like, you know, keep moving. We've got HBO, and we need to move from there. And so I said, what should I do next? He said, well, let's get together. We'll talk about it. So we chatted about it. He had a buddy with him who he was in business with, a guy named Ken Gunner. Bob was a liberal Democrat from this area, and Ken Gunner was a conservative Republican actually former member of the John Birch Society from Texas. And those guys were best of friends and worked together and succeeded very nicely. And so we started right there. It wasn't smooth sailing. Uh, a lot of people in our industry said, no, we don't like that idea. And so we had to go back to the drawing board. And eventually, the House had been talking about televising. They didn't know how or why, but they had talked to each other about it. They were losing out to the Senate. Uh, Sam Rayburn, for years, wouldn't allow cameras in the House hearing. And in the Senate, they always allowed cameras in. And the Senate wasn't on television yet, but they got their faces on every night because they were senators. They were six-year terms and all that. And so I, I found out that they were going to go on television. And I went back to Bob. And he said, boy, I like that idea. I might be able to really sell this one. I said, well, let's don't try to make money with it just like this operation. Let's don't try to make money with it. Let's just support it in some way. And he said, I like that idea. He went back and he said, here's a check for $25,000. Take this, put it in the bank, and see if anybody else will do it. And so I started walking around asking people. I'd asked them before, and they all said no. And I went to see a man named Russell Karp here in New York. Ran teleprompter cable. It's a name you don't hear anymore. And I saw Ralph Baruch, who ran what was Viacom. It's now Viacom. And those two, they were New Yorkers. Uh, Ralph Baruch escaped Europe, uh, walking over the French Alps to get away from Hitler and that whole crowd. Unfortunately, he's not here anymore. I think, I'm not sure, Russell Karp left our business a long time ago. And I think he still lives here. Bob Rosencrantz is gone. But those three men were the first three checks. And they didn't react as if, oh, boy, I can make more money with it. I'll never forget. I walked, I, Russell was hard to get a hold of. And he was a man about 6'5 and big. And I was me and <laughs> you know, scared to death of him. And uh, I'd already been in his office. And he said no. And, and he, he, was, uh, he was a very strong business guy. So anyway, I walked up to him after a hearing. He testified. I got him in the hallway because he couldn't get away from me. And I said, Mr. Carp, never called him Russ. Mr. Carp, I have this idea. Bob Rosencrantz has given me $25,000. I had to talk very quickly. Uh, and what we want to do is televise the House of Representatives when it goes on television next year. He didn't miss a beat. He said, I love that idea. And he, had, he was very political. I didn't know it at the time. He said, had we had that, maybe we wouldn't have gotten the Vietnam War. That was his reaction. Right or wrong, but that was his reaction. Ralph Baruch came to Washington, and I said, I got to talk to you. And I went to the Madison Hotel, and he was there. And I went to his hotel room. And I said, here's what we're doing. And Ralph Baruch, without hesitation, said, you have my commitment for three years. Here's my check. That's really how it started. 
There's more to the story than that, but that's how it started. And not a one of them wanted to know what the numbers were. They didn't want to know what ratings were. They didn't care whether we had stars. And I promised them, I said, I'm not a business person, but I'll learn it somehow or another with your help. And I said to Bob Rosencrantz, what do I do now? <laughs> he said, well, you write a business plan. And I said, what's a business plan? And he said, well, if you will do this, come to Connecticut, where I live, and I'll spend a day with you, and we'll write a business plan. And, I, and you just have to, Bob Rosencrantz is just a wonderful human being. I'm really sad that he's gone. And we did it. We wrote a business plan. It wasn't very sophisticated, but it was a business plan. And I could say, Bob Rosencrantz helped me write this. I have his check. I have Ralph Bruce's check. I have, you, know, you, know, you all know how this works. It, that's the only way something like this can work. And one of my favorite moments ever was when Bob said, I want you to meet my mother. I said, where does she live? New York City. How old is she? 90. Why do you want me to meet your mother? He said, because my mother watches C-SPAN all the time. And I used to go on the Larry King show, and every time Larry would ask me, how did you start this? He didn't remember from one day to the next, but he'd always ask me. <laughs> and and it, was, it was fantastic. I was able to say Bob Rosencrantz, and his mother listened. And she'd call him up, no, Bob, I can't believe. I said, this guy Lamb was on the radio last night. He's giving you credit for C-SPAN. I love it. Anyway, she was about that big. She came from Austria. Her husband came from Russia. You heard the stories. They are so committed to public affairs. <clears throat> and it was a highlight of, of me to go to her apartment and meet her. And she was so proud of her Bob. And she had a reason to be proud of her Bob because he was just a genuinely committed guy. He also, by the way, was responsible for get, writing the first check for something called Public Affairs Book. That's where this book was published. Brooke Parsons is with us today from Public Affairs, and that's where the first, I think he wrote a half million dollar check in this case to Public Affairs Books to get that started. And he's also the guy that started the first check for Blocking Heads TV, Blogging, blogging Heads TV, not Blocking Heads, uh, which was started by Bob Wright down in New Jersey. And anyway, that is still, I think, in business today. Some of you have probably been on there. So the civic mindedness of the American business person is critical for something like C-SPAN. It did not come from the government. There's not a dime's worth of federal funds in C-SPAN. There never has been, and there never will be as long as I'm there, because I don't believe in mixing taxpayer money through the government uh, for media. It's just my own personal beliefs. But that's how this all started. And again, not a scholar, a speech major from Purdue University. Uh, I decided that the only way I was going to get to know this, and we've got a very famous historian in this audience, Ted Widmer, a uh, fantastic historian. And uh, I've interviewed him several times. Uh, and he's got a book coming out on Lincoln, which is very interesting, that you'll learn more about it. It takes a little time to get the, he, just, he said, either today or tomorrow, he's turning the manuscript in. And it'll be a nine months to a year before the book comes out. But, I had to figure out how I was going to learn this stuff. I was, you know, I was not a historian. I'm not to this day an historian. <clears throat> and this is a long way leading up to why this book exists. But I decided, after I interviewed a man named Richard Norton Smith in 1993, he's on the cover of this, very important to me personally and to this C-SPAN network and all that. <clears throat> I interviewed him one day. He had a book on Washington. And I said, how did you get started in all this? And he said, well, I was with a family, and they wanted to go to parks and zoos and all that stuff. And he said, the only way on these vacations that I'll go is if I can go to the grave sites of presidents. And of course, his family said, whatever you say, Richard, we want you with us. And so they started out, and he went to every grave site of every president. Now, he is a historian of the finest. Uh, and I said, right there on the spot, I said, I'm going to do that. So in the next 18 months, I went out of my way every day I could to find a gravesite. And I finished all of them. And I went out to, he was running the Reagan Library at the time. And I went out and I had taken a picture at every gravesite. Even in three cases, there was nobody within sight. I had to take a, in those days, there weren't such things as selfies. I stood there with this camera like this so I could prove to him that I'd been to these gravesites. And then I said to myself, I'm going to one-up him. 
I'm never going to one-up him historically, so I went to all the grave sites of all the vice presidents. <laughs> now, I had a leg up on that because 14 of them became presidents, so I'd already been to their grave sites. <laughs> Again, going back to my Franklin McCormick story and WGN, the idea of going there was helping me figure some of this stuff out. And then when C-SPAN continued to grow and we continued to do authors and we did books and uh, it seemed like a great for us an alternative besides just the politics of it. Then on this program I had called Book Notes which morphed into Q&A and it's been 30 years that this has been on the air <clears throat> and which I will be stopping in a couple of weeks just because it's time to stop it. Um, I started interviewing historians about presidents and all of this started to, you know, accumulate in the way of information. Susan Swain, whose name is on the book as a co-editor of this book, is incredible at editing. She's done her own interviewing. She's going to take over the Q&A program when I step down, which I'm very happy about. And we've done 10 of these books. And this one, The Presidents, uh, is tricky because a lot of you in this audience have a lot of opinions about presidents. Some of you are historians and know a lot more than I'll ever know about it. And whenever you play around with presidents, you get slammed. I mean, the best thing about this little book is that there are 44 chapters, and they're all different historians. And they all have their own approach to it. And there are about 10 or 11 pages on each president. I need to qualify it. These are not biographies. They are slices of their lives, the president's lives. And some of them are terribly relevant, and some of them aren't. But it is a primer. This is just an opportunity, if you're interested, to start digging in. And then we have created a website where there's a lot of background information that you can go to. But these little vignettes in here um, have some fascinating information in them. One, just a small, tiny little thing, was that James K. Polk, who you haven't thought about in a lot of, a lot of years, was a one-term president. Uh, he walked out of the presidency and three months later was dead, 53 years old. But he had four books, diaries. I mean, the diary thing is something that I just... I don't know how many of these new presidents will keep diaries, but that's one of the things that I learned. <clears throat> Ted did a book on Martin Van Buren, and a really good book. It's only a couple hundred pages. Uh, you know, that's an easy read. You, the worst ones are these seven, eight hundred page books, uh, and that's why we did only eleven pages on each president. So it's it's easy to capture uh, the moment. But James K. Polk had his diary, but in the front of this book is a picture of, of a man named Peter uh, Brummy who is at the Massachusetts Historical Association. I was there, and this is the kind of excitement that I get in doing this, the J John Quincy Adams diary, which is the most amazing thing you've ever seen. There's a picture of him right in the front of this book where he is looking through it, and I said, this is how goofy it gets for somebody. Can I touch that? Can I handle that? Sure, go ahead. I mean, he's watching me like a hawk. I mean, it, you make the wrong move and you're a dead person. But, uh, and I understand why. But the diaries, and I mean, it was a massive diary. He wrote it almost all of his life. There was only one short hiatus period. But you learn a lot of little things. And I, I want to read, and then we can open it up to questions. I want to hear from you all. Um, a woman named Edna Green Medford, who is the dean of arts and sciences at Howard University, a fabulous human being. I mean, just a wonderful person who's been on C-SPAN for the last 30 years. We asked her and Richard Norton Smith and Doug Brinkley to write little essays that would go in this book, kind of framing the book and the presidency. There's one paragraph she leads off her essay. I just read it, and I, there's not a soul in this room that's going to disagree with this. But it's something that the younger people are now for their own reasons, and we were talking about this earlier, are discovering without knowing why they're feeling strange about this democracy and this republic and this country. But I think this says a lot, and it starts like this, just one paragraph. Americans take great pride in our exceptionalism. 
We think of ourselves as the guardians of democracy. The citizens of a nation without parallel, more moral, and infinitely more humane than the rest. We explain away contradictions to our self-image as simply anomalies. But history suggests otherwise. It reminds us that seeds of inequality and injustice took root alongside the love of liberty, that this counter-narrative reflects American political and cultural traditions as much as the notion that we are a land of opportunity and a defender of the rights of all. This, for me, personally, a lot of you in this room are way ahead of me. This has been not just this paragraph, but this experience of finding out what it was really like through these presidency has been a tremendous education. And we only hope there's no money in this for us, no money in this for me. Uh, public affairs gets all the money, and they deserve it. Uh, the, we just hope that people will get an opportunity to learn a little bit at a time about the presidency and about their country. Joanne. You're in charge. Go for it. Thank you. Wow. I mean, on behalf of all of us here, I can't thank you enough for encouraging us to learn about our nation's past and our present as well. So thank you again. And I'd like to open the floor to questions, and I just ask that you wait until the microphone comes to you and you introduce yourself before you ask the question. First question. Uh, Ron Berenbaum, I'm, I'm a big fan of these uh, presidential uh, ranking systems. Did, did you rank them in, in some way? Okay, so that, that, that would, uh, I remember the first one of these for me, and possibly for some of the older people in the room, was in 1962, Arthur Schlesinger's father, his father, uh, put out the first ranking system in my memory. And in that, uh, Woodrow Wilson ranked fourth, and I think Andrew Jackson ranked seventh. Eisenhower, who had just left office, ranked 22nd, and Grant ranked nearly last. Now, in the more recent ones I've seen, uh, and I entirely approve, and I'm totally uh, approving of, of these changes, uh, Wilson and Jackson have dropped considerably. Uh, Eisenhower has moved up to be neck and neck with uh, Truman, something neither one of them would have been very happy about. But uh, And um, uh, Grant is up around 15, and many people think someday he'll get to be uh, in the top group because of his support. Uh, for civil rights. So what do you think is coming down the pike? What do you look for in terms of major changes and assessments the next time you put this book out? Well, the, the, explain a little bit about our survey. Um, it was Susan's idea at, at C-SPAN to, to do the rankings uh, and the, the way we listed in the book. I, that was not my, I wasn't particularly in favor of it. I, these rankings are interesting, but I don't think they are the end-all, be-all. And in, back to your point, Eisenhower in our survey is five, Truman six. Uh, Grant is not quite 15 in ours. He's 22nd, but he's come up from 33. And uh, Jackson is on his way down from 13 to 18. Uh, I think it's what we're doing, and it's the same thing with my own personal experience. I think it's just learning more about what they did, even though we have 10 categories that they're judged on. And one of them is the, what it was like in that, the, their current time. But some of the stuff that they did is, is really hard to accept, no matter when it happened. And to put somebody that's been an anti-Semite or a uh, white supremacist, uh, it's very hard to see them, <clears throat> certainly in the top 10. I mean, Woodrow Wilson is falling also. and. Uh, he was, as you said, way up there. He's, in ours, he's still 11. Um, and I, think, I don't think the future is going to be that good for him, just given what we're seeing right now and given what we're seeing among the young people. They're not buying a lot of these excuses, as, as uh, um, the dean said in, in her remarks there. They're just not willing to look the other way like uh, a lot of people have over the years based on the fact that they may have liked them. They were either in their party. Uh, whatever, and so we probably are going through a very important 
change in, in uh, the country. Who knows where that goes? But thank you for your comments. Well, let me ask you. Oh, I didn't see. Donald? Uh, Don Simmons. Um, during the Civil War, uh, President Lincoln suspended habeas corpus. So I believe that's never happened since. So it's an illustration of a presidential power taken and then surrendered. Are there other such examples? And secondly, do you expect that will happen with some of the um, uh, powers that President Trump is asserting? I am not a commentator. Uh, I mean, the Alien Sedition Acts, the way that we treated the Japanese, uh, Chinese, even uh, others. I mean, you can go on and on with this. Um, I would literally talk, turn to a historian to answer that, and I'm going to ask Ted uh, if, if he has any opinion on that. Where's the microphone? We might make sure we can hear you. Question about Abraham Lincoln and habeas corpus or, or about Donald Whether Trump? Whether we're going to get more of it. Of presidents who surrendered? I'm trying to think. Um, we're in an interesting week in which this question is, is in the news on an hourly basis, I, I, I would say. And a lot of us, I'll, I'll respect too that there are people from both party backgrounds, but a lot of us are hoping the traditional form of oversight over the White House is Congress. And that's how the founders wanted the system to work. Congress is the first branch and the most important branch, and we'd like to see Congress live up to its responsibilities, That because presidents left unchecked will not check themselves. That's just human nature, and it's the nature of our system that people will take as much power as they can possibly get. But if we have a balance, an effective balance with strengths on both sides, which is how the system was designed, then uh, it'll work much better. So we're hoping Congress will find some backbone. I, mean, I think the only thing that we can really look to is protecting the future is are, are the checks and balances. I mean, you go back to the Nixon experience, and I worked in his administration, <clears throat> and I was very young and very naive, and when the tapes came out, uh, and I read the transcripts, it was very difficult. I got, I left, uh, not, at, you know, frankly, I was 26 years old or something like that. I was, it was not in complete and total disgust as much as it was, everything stopped in Washington, and it was a terrible period, and we now, since that time, have learned a lot more about that. But uh, Judge Sirica had a lot more to do with the downfall of Richard Nixon than he ever gets credit for. And that's, again, it wasn't just the Washington Post. They have the ink and they have the paper and they can tell us day after day how important they were and are. But there's a lot more of the system that's important to keep your eye on, like the Supreme Court decision on the tapes, like the fact that Alex Butterfield, for instance, in those days spoke up and said we had the taping system. I can go on and on about this. As a matter of fact, I'll divert just a second to tell you uh, one of the people that I do admire most in politics and history would surprise you um, because it's not a president, but it's the wife of a president, and uh, it's Mrs. Lyndon Johnson. And here's why. Only one reason why. I did the last interview with her on television a uh, short time before she, she, she didn't, I don't know how many years she lived after that, but I always had a question for her because C-SPAN has run on its radio station almost every Oval Office conversation that the, uh, President Johnson had that was taped. And they're very interesting if you haven't listened to them. And I'm not talking about the silly ones. I'm talking about the, the uh, hard-nosed policy and discussions with members of Congress. But the question I asked, and it was the first question in the interview. It was an hour interview. And she couldn't see at that time. She had, was blind. And it was down on the ranch where she lived a lot of the time. And I said, Mr. Johnson, before we start, I have one question. When you were in the White House and the president was taping those telephone conversations, did you know that you were being taped? The answer to her question was no. And if you go back and listen to the tapes, she was honest all the time. And as a matter of fact, when he was doing something that wanted to cut corners, she would say, now, Lyndon, and one of those great stories is Walter Jenkins. 
and those of you who know that name, I don't need to go into great de detail. He wanted to cover it up. He wanted to give him a, she wanted to give him a job. She felt sorry for him uh, that he'd had this great career and then had been picked up for uh, uh, some activities at the YMCA right around October in the election year. He wanted, to, he wanted to bury it. She said, no, Lyndon, he's our friend. You go back and listen to it, and that's an honest person. And that was, again, a marvelous opportunity to see, because of these tapes, who's honest and who's dishonest. And Lyndon Johnson, you know, I worked around him also for two years. Um, whatever you want to say about him, one of the best words in history is, and in politics, is the word but. B-U-T, but. And I hear people do this all the time. Lyndon Johnson did a marvelous thing for civil rights in this country, but Vietnam. And if you like what he did in civil rights, you overlook often what he did in Vietnam. And from my perspective, I was in the military. Vietnam was one of the worst things that's ever happened to this country in history because a lot of reasons that you all know. So the interesting thing about history is apply the word but every time you think about this when you're talking about a president. So-and-so was a great president, but Woodrow Wilson's a good example, and that's part of the reason why he's going down. Anyway, I'm rambling. No, it was great. Thanks, Susan. Susan Gittleson. Uh, the change in the background of our president says a lot about the country. So one thinks of Andrew Jackson uh, bringing in the, the, the West or whatever it is, um, and, uh, and then having a, a black president. Who would have thought? Uh, Woodrow Wilson wouldn't have thought of a black president. So now the question is, uh, what about women? We have so many women presidential candidates. We had a very uh, exemplary woman who couldn't make it. What do you think about the future for women? All you have to do is turn on your television set. All you have to do is come to the House of Representatives. When I first went to Washington, one of my I'm going to go there to see it for myself times was at night when I was in the Navy at the Pentagon. At night, I would go by myself down to the House of Representatives and sit in the balcony, sit in the gallery. And one of the interesting things, and I want to be careful not to overstate this, but there was a lot of drinking that went on in the nighttime sessions. And they weren't on television. And nobody would know it. There was a time when I sat up there and they had a band that they'd broken out down in the, you know, there was this guy playing the sax and all this stuff. But nobody knew it. Absolutely nobody knew it. Uh, and um, what was it? Remind me of women. There were, there were very, there were very, very few women. There, there were over 100 women in the House of Representatives. The, the answer to that is it's going to happen. When it happens, I don't know. It could happen in the next election. Uh, it's been, we've been slow as a country, as you know. We've been, from Adira Ganda to uh, uh, Ms. Mayer over in Israel, on and on around the world. But we're slow to it, but it'll happen. And um, the change, what I said about the television is, I'm, the women who are appearing now on television are, I, um, they may be more than the men. And when I was, again, started out in television, there were no women, no commentators, there were one or two, and they got all the attention because, of, understandably, the women uh, didn't, didn't have any visibility. But one of the best books that I ever interviewed was Nan Robertson's book. Uh, uh, I think it was the title was Ladies in the Gallery, uh, or Ladies in the Balcony. And it, it's hard for me to believe that in 1992, no women were allowed to sit in Washington, in the press club, in the audience. They had to sit up in the balcony. And you go down that road, you're going to see how ridiculous all this stuff was in the past. Yesterday, I was online looking about women voting. If you want to have an interesting experience, and you all know we were about 1920 in this country, go and look at the other countries. There's, this, there's a, a Wikipedia site that will show you where every other country started women voting. And it will, it's incredible, much beyond 1920. So it's going to happen. It's just a matter of time. And let's hope that you and I are still around to see it. Right here. Hi, I'm Carol Spummer. I just have a um, question as to getting a glimpse of the top rank, the bottom rank, 
And was there one that was most surprising to you as to where, they, where that president turned out? Thank you, because I need to explain also that I didn't rank these presidents. Uh, they were ranked just, we took Mr. Schlesinger's uh, idea, and I will say one thing we did add to it is a little balance. Um, when you go to political scientists in most universities, there's not a lot of balance there. And so we infuse a little balance in the, these surveys. Not, not much change, by the way, which is interesting. I think that comes through. You can go on line on Google and go to Wikipedia, and they have a chart with all the different surveys, and you can track everybody's different survey. The fascinating thing for me is that on this survey, John Kennedy's eight, the American Political Science Association just had him at 16. And uh, so this is a work in progress. As far as ours, Abraham Lincoln, number one, George Washington, number two, we opened up our book tour at Mount Vernon. I don't think they were too happy with us. I'm kidding. They didn't. They didn't. They. They. As far as they're concerned, it's George all the way, all the time. Um, and by the way, he has the most successful site in this country among presidents, and it's run by the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. And there's no government money involved in that one either, which is interesting. Um, FDR's three. Theodore Roosevelt, four. Dwight Eisenhower, five, Harry Truman, six, Jefferson. Jefferson's hanging in there at seven. I'm not sure how long that lasts either, but there's so much emotion about what he wrote more than a lot of the things uh, about his personal life that uh, are there. Um, on the bottom, the, none of these will surprise you. The one that freaks everybody out is how in the world there could be one, two, three, four, five below William Henry Harrison. And William Henry Harrison, who uh, was the governor of the great uh, Indiana Territory, uh, is uh, number 38, and he was only in office 31 days. <clears throat> and behind, right below him is his vice president, John Tyler, and then Warren Harding, Franklin Pierce, Andrew Johnson, and the ever popular James Buchanan is last. And uh, there are a lot of reasons for James Buchanan being last, including uh, he didn't have anything absolutely directly to do with this, but the Dred Scott decision was, came down in, went during his presidency. And uh, actually, there's even a speech, I think, where he indicated he knew how it was going to come out. Uh, so he's, I, I, he may be there forever. Uh, and a lot of people today who have such emotions about the current president think he's going to end up below James Buchanan. <laughs> but if you apply all 10 of our uh, Categories. I'm not sure that's that, that would be the case. I just I don't know, and I won't be judging him. And there were for me, no surprises because I don't have a strong feeling about where they belong in the first place. But a lot of other people can get very exercised about this stuff. Um, before we proceed further, could you just say something about the qualities uh, that you use to measure them? Sure. Yeah, I think um, people would be interested in hearing that. They. Uh, I, I have to find it here in our introduction. Public persuasion. Crisis leadership, economic management, moral authority. In some cases, and I won't go into great detail, moral authority has puts some of these presidents way down because of that alone. Uh, international relations, administrative skills, which is a tough one to really judge. Relations with Congress, that's where Lyndon Johnson made out like a bandit. And if you listen to those tapes, you can see why. They're really fascinating if you haven't ever listened to them. And they will teach you more in one hour than you can ever get anywhere else about a relationship between human beings and how he cajoled people to pass the things that he wanted passed. Vision's another category. Pursuit equal justice for all. Performance within the context of the times. And it seems to me that's a tough one. Uh, it's a really tough one to judge. Do you think also going forward that because of the political climate today that the qualities will change and there'll be more emphasis on certain ones like truthfulness going forward and judging? <laughs> I do. Uh, I mean, but that's where I personally am coming from. I mean, the right. thing is, I remember back when we started C-SPAN that my role model was Bob Rosencrantz, and he was the most ethical person that I've ever met in business. And there was never any doubt for him. You just didn't break the law. You didn't cut corners. And, and no matter 
what was going on in our industry, Bob was always saying, we're going to do the right thing. And he, by the way, he was not a proselytizer. He was not a moralizer. He just lived his life. And every, I mean, his kids are fabulous. Um, his grandkids are, he's got 11 grandkids there. It's just a tremendous family. David, yeah. you had your hand up. <laughs> uh, David Hunt. Uh, my question was, uh, you really answered it just now. What are the criteria used in, in judging uh, presidents? But let me ask you, because you've answered that now. Uh, let me ask you, what do you think are the most important personal qualities that a president should have to be successful? Hmm. Well, one of my favorites is tell the truth. It's been hard on a lot of them. Uh, it's hard on politicians to tell the truth. Um, and I, I said recently, probably shouldn't have, but I said recently in a Wall Street Journal uh, article was written that uh, the thing that's changed the most for me is the amount of lying that goes on in Washington, D.C. Uh, and among our politicians on all sides. I don't care how strongly you feel about your side. There's just a lot of lying going on. I think in the future, kind of dovetailing on what you say, that, that, that the moral authority is going to be very high on people's lists. I think, um, I think John Kennedy's in for a rough ride. And um, the, if you haven't read the Mimi Beardsley book uh, that was published, it's really tough. You read that and you wonder, he got away with it. Uh, and everybody wants to fall in love with John Kennedy. And I don't, it's, it's your business if you want to or not. But you read that book and it just, it's just like all of these characters and their decision to use their power to prey on other human beings. It's going to get worse and worse, I think, because um, people are, you know, people are more attuned to it now than they used to be. And we know a lot more. And there's just a lot in the past that we didn't know about. There are fabulous New Yorkers in this book, by the name of Ron Chernow, and Harold Holzer, uh, and Robert Caro, and James Traub, and Amity Slays. Uh, they're all based in New York, and they're all in this book for their own presidencies. Uh, and there's nobody that's done, well, first of all, Harold Holzer's done 53 books, most of them on Lincoln. Uh, and he just lives, eats, and sleeps, it, and he's just, he's as much of an authority um, as anybody I know. Ted Widmer's probably right behind him now that he's lived with Lincoln for the last, <laughs> uh, but what Rob Carroll has done for presidential history in London Johnson uh, is just one of the most fascinating things I've ever been able to be around. I've interviewed him many hours, and we uh, videoed him down at the library. We've known him when they wouldn't allow his books to be sold in the bookstore. We've known him when they've allowed his books to be sold in the bookstore. And everybody uh, who's interested in, in his fifth book, he says, you're going to have to wait a while, and he's 83 years old. Uh, and they're all anxious to see how he comes out. And it will all be based. Uh, on, what, on how he comes out on Vietnam and civil rights. They started to warm up to him down at the Lyndon Johnson Library when he went positive in the fourth book on civil rights. Uh, <coughs> but he wasn't even invited to speak. He's now been invited to speak. These presidential centers around the country are important, but they are very, very strongly, with their backs against the wall, defensive about everything from their presidencies. And uh, it's... Uh, it's been interesting to watch that, too. I mean, it's, uh, they, uh, I would just tell you this. One of the library, I won't tell you who it was, one of the libraries did not want us there because of where they ranked in, in, in this poll. And uh, we said, fine. We said, fine. You know, it's, uh, it's your business. But uh, these libraries, except for two of them, one of them is the Rutherford B. Hayes Library. And, in uh, Fremont, Ohio, which is run by the state of Ohio, and the Mount Vernon, well, the three. Mount, Mount Vernon is run by the Ladies Association, and Lincoln's, which is relatively new since 2006, five or six, is, is run by state money and, uh, and, and, and fees. These uh, federal libraries are they're funded in two different ways. One is um, well, they, the money that comes through the door but there is a federal uh, 
money that comes in to run the library itself, and then there's the foundation money that comes from the true believers of that candidate or people that want to support them. And uh, it can be very difficult, those of you who followed the Nixon Library problem uh, and why they didn't want the feds to run it. And then when they decided to, they finally got the papers, and then they got uh, terribly upset with uh, the way Watergate was portrayed. Uh, it's hard. Truth is hard. Truth is hard. Anthony. Uh, Anthony Fairless. Who of the presidents would you most like to interview? And maybe you could give us a flavor of the kind of conversation you'd have. Never thought about it. Um, never thought about it. Uh, we, um, uh, pre I've interviewed about, I think, I don't know, six or seven of them. They're the hardest interview I'll ever have for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, they've answered almost every question you can imagine with all the different people that get to them. Um, two, everybody's watching every question you ask and every single thing you do. And so you have a tension about you that's not normal. And um, most interviews I do, there's no tension. When I interviewed Ted, no, I wasn't uptight at all. Uh, but it's a conversation. It's fun. It's interesting. I can't wait to hear what he has to say. I mean, he did this great interview on Martin Van Buren. Uh, but, you know, I, I, it's the, I suppose the obvious but often they are so used, they, they are so capable of not answering the question. They are. They're very capable. And they're also capable, you've seen it, of dominating the conversation, going off on a tangent. They're not just that, they're just not that much fun. I, I love, I've got all kinds of stories about what it was like to interview presidents, and they're, they're not meaningful in the course of human affairs. Uh, I'll give you one quick one. Um, Bill Clinton was very open to us, and we had probably six, seven interviews with him. But when he was in the White House, we asked if we could come in, do an hour with him, which is very difficult anymore to ever get, and do a little tour of the Oval Office, and then sit down with him for about 40 minutes and talk politics. And he's one of the better people to interview because he doesn't rush in to give an answer. And he, so anyway, we're set up 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, we're all set up. We've got our people there. And then this is another thing you can't see is about 15 people show up on the president's staff and stand at the back of the room and glare at you. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not exaggerating. It's like, don't you dare, you know, whatever it is. So you look back and you see all these people standing there. Two o'clock came around and he was to be there and they said he's running a little late. He's always late. Ten after two. 20 after 2, no Bill Clinton. 2.30, no Bill Clinton. About 2.35, they said the bells just went off. He'll be here in five minutes. So I went outside. He came up. We hooked our microphones up. He was terribly interested in Socks the Cat. Played with the cat for a while. Um, we walked into the Oval Office. We did the tour. And he's really good at it. We did the tour. Sat down, he's behind his desk, I'm sitting there, ready to start the interview, and I ask him a question, and another question, and all of a sudden I look up at our camera person in the room, and he says this, and I'm thinking, uh, they're, not gonna, they're not doing this. They're not going to do this to me. And so I kept asking questions, and then I got a, a severe now. So what had happened? They took the 40 minutes he was late out of our time. And there is no way I am, in spite of the fact that I'm just a lowly Hoosier from Lafayette, Indiana, I have the hair did stand up on the back of my head. <laughs> and I don't care if it is the President of the United States. I was so mad I left the Oval Office immediately. He was, he was oblivious to what was going on. He said, oh, let's all get up here and have a picture. And I said, uh-uh, no, nope, I'm gone. Didn't say anything. I just went back to the, to the, the network. That happens all the time. And that's why when you ask the question, you know, I'm not going to go through that anymore. I'm done with that stuff. <laughs> and it's not a joy. I mean, it's fun to tell the stories, but you gain nothing from that except a nice little 20-minute tour of the old office. So I'm not being, it's not a good answer for you, but that's, I could go off and say, oh, it'd be so much fun to interview Abraham Lincoln, but not going to happen. <laughs> For many reasons, right? 
Um, do we have any more questions? Over here, then come back to you. Hi, Mr. Lamb, Zach Badworth. So um, it was interesting for me to hear your story about sitting in the congressional galleries and watching the jazz band or whatever it was, because um, obviously in that time, less transparency, and I think C-SPAN obviously changed a lot of that. And we've seen so much more information be available these days. We even have congressional representatives live streaming, making their own dinners, right? So, so much information, yet at the same time, there's so much solo silos of information as well, polarization, people receiving just conservative news or just uh, liberal news, and I think it's sort of divisive, right? So I was wondering if you could talk about your view of the changing media landscape and that polarization that exists. Zach, uh, interesting observation. I, um, I'm not your normal uh, viewer and taker of information, um, and so it's hard for me to know. I have. I have friends, like you do, I'm sure, that send me articles every day from their point of view, and I just go, stop. I get up at 4 o'clock in the morning. I start by exercising and turning on the television set. I go to Fox and MSNBC and CNN and the local news constantly. And C-SPAN, of course, all three channels, and I'm constantly looking, teach me something. And those who only reside at one place, I, I just can't deal with it. I mean, it's, it, it's like this morning was a great. We, we have set up our phone call program in the morning from 7 to 10 so that we take one from the right, one from the left, one from the middle, one, you know, all this stuff. And I'm watching this morning saying, Bill Barr is the worst human being that ever lived on the face of the earth. He ought to be fired. And then, or impeached if they could get away with that one. And the other one saying, Bill Barr is the greatest attorney general in the history of the world. And I'll guarantee you, other than when they're watching us, they're either watching CNN or MSNBC or Fox. And I, it's a free country. I must tell you, though, I grew up in a media environment in Washington where everybody said, everybody in the media said they were fair, objective, and just down the middle, and that was a bunch of baloney. I'm a little happier frustrating, but a little happier knowing when I tune into CNN, it is Trump prosecution central. <laughs> when I tune in MSNBC, it's an arm of the Democratic National Committee. And they find Republicans that agree with the Democratic National Committee. When I tune into Fox, they often ignore what's going on as a way for them not to have to, and I'm talking out of school here, defend the President of the United States, or some of their hosts Defend the President of the United States no matter what. By the way, if you haven't looked lately, the First Amendment agrees with all this. You can do any of this you want to. And I watch it all. I have the same human reaction that a lot of people do. I think we're healthier in a way, knowing exactly where people are coming from. There's no doubt in my mind where all these people are coming from. Uh, and, and so there's so much choice. If you don't like it, you can go other places. I would just recommend. And, that you go different places and listen to different voices and absorb it on your own terms instead of just saying, I'm going to go home every night and be only in my comfort zone. But I cannot, I can't tell anybody. It's, it, you know, we really misunderstand what, what freedom of speech is. I mean, I, when I hear somebody call our call and show, you say, I've got to shut that guy down. Really? Do you understand anything about what's supposed to be special about our Constitution? And a lot of people uh, need to learn it. We just we try the best we can to keep all these sides coming in. You're all being very patient this morning. This is really deep stuff this early in the morning. OK, well, this isn't deep. Um, you apropos you your comment, yourself, please? I'm sorry? Introduce yourself, please. I'm Jackie Aaron. OK. Hi, Jackie. Apropos your comment about the defensiveness of the staffs at the presidential libraries, what is the line taken, for example, by the apologists for James Buchanan? They, they're very unhappy. They think he gets a rough deal. I mean, there aren't many apologists for James Buchanan. Let's start with that. Uh, 
But if you go to Wheatland in Lebanon, uh, Pennsylvania, you'll find somebody that says, you're, he's get, you're giving this guy a raw deal. The book on him is the worst period, president period ever, period. And uh, th that's, I mean, he, you know, it may, it probably is not to altogether fair because the man had as much experience as anybody that's ever been president, including being Secretary of State, Senator, Representative, all that stuff. But uh, that's why I don't get too carried away myself with these polls because it's not nearly as important as understanding how the whole historical thing works. And having a poll is good enough for a day or so, knowing what's the background on, say, the worst thing about this country over the last 250 years is slavery. And when I was growing up in Indiana, I had absolutely no idea about it. And this education for me is just frightening. I mean, when you see the way we have treated certain people in our society, it's just frightening. And it's... Marlon? I'm Marlon Matson from Wild Cornell Medical College. I wanted to mention that uh, for my spouse and I, one of the true highlights of every week is listening to question and answers. I mean, this, this program is spectacular. Recently, you had an interview with Robert Carroll, and you described, or he described, you know, the process that he goes through to be able to write about his subject, uh, what he requires for himself. And my question is, what is the process that you go through? Because it's clear from the excerpts that you show, videos, and the questions that you ask that you do a great deal of preparation, but I would be interested in knowing how you go about preparing to actually have an interview uh, with an author. Thank you. Uh, first and foremost, I have a, another person in this little game besides my long-suffering wife, uh, a fellow named Nick Ravel. And Nick and I work together. He's the producer. We had this long conversation you know, day after day after day, uh, sparring back and forth, having fun over the next interview. And um, it's, uh, we decide he goes out and finds the person, asks them to come on. Not everybody will come on. Politicians don't want to sit for an hour. That's another development over the years. You go back to your question. They don't want to sit for an hour and talk through the, these situations. They, they prefer their six minutes on a program. They can get in, have what they say, and then get out. I personally, um, if it's a book, I read the book, most of the book. It's not always the case that all of it is necessary to read in order to be ready for an interview. I get online and look up everything I can find online. Uh, I spend about 15 to 20 hours getting ready for it. It's not necessary. It's just the way I wanted to do it, because this is all part of my own personal learning experience. And I literally sit down and interview somebody, and my first thought there is, what can I get that person to say that will go over my shoulder, into the camera, out to the country, and people can learn. It's not about, can I get them? Can I, you know, is it a gotcha thing? We don't have ratings. I am not a star. Uh, we don't have commercials. And our industry, going back to Bob Rosencrantz, Ralph Baruch, and uh, Russell Karp, and others, many others, they said, go do your thing. They have never, ever questioned us in 40 years about how big is your audience. There's not any place else that I know of in television that that happens. Nowhere else does that happen. And we're just lucky to do it. So I feel my, I'm educating myself, and then I want to pass it on. And Nick, uh, is, he's also from an immigrant family. His parents came from India. Uh, he's a fantastic, he's another Midwesterner. He was born in Chicago. I went to the University of Illinois. There's something about the Midwest, I have to say, that's very special, and I'm sure you all agree. Uh, but, but Nick, he, he has an instinct about, and we talk about clips, he'll find them. And we, that, that's all that is, is a way for you, if we're talking about somebody that, in history that we've never seen for a long time, and it just comes up with a 30-second clip so you can feel what they're, what they're like. That's how it's done. It's no magic. It's that simple. Well, after this morning, all I can say is Brian Lamb on C-SPAN is wonderful, but Brian Lamb in person is better than the Joanne. best. Joanne. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Joanne. Thank, Thank you. you. We have a table set up for you to sell you. Thank you.